the regular commission meeting of May 10th, 2023. Thank you, any further discussion? All right, thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, motion carries. And we'll move on to the executive director's report. Curtis, if you would please provide your remarks. Terrific, thank you, Madam President. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, guests, employees. Really nice to see everyone this morning. Um, Commission officers and executive team just came from uh, a meeting with a group of our new employees, uh, just a, another fantastic group of uh, recruits who have joined the port in the last three or four months, uh, firefighters, electricians, federal affairs manager, just a great bunch. They're watching on YouTube, so hi, everybody. Um, it's just super encouraging to see um, diverse, uh, dynamic employees coming to the port to help serve our mission. So really enjoy that uh, each time we get the chance to do it. Uh, I would like to recognize our safety champions on the screen, if I could. Um, there we go. <clears throat> uh, Carrie in our um, lost and found shop, uh, Daniel in our uh, marine maintenance team, uh, Holly and Nathan, both uh, engaged in the operations of the port, really watching out for themselves and their coworkers. I just wanna thank them, uh, recognize them for their great contribution to uh, keeping our operations safe. And with that, I'd like to call on David Stanton to come up and uh, give us a safety message for the day. Thanks, Dave. Morning. I'm Dave Stanton. I'm the Ports Construction Safety Manager, and my pronouns are he and him. I perform oversight of contractor safety to include capital projects, tenant improvements, and service providers. Uh, the majority of my focus right now is the Terminal Core project. June is National Safety Month, and today's safety message highlights the safety successes of the Hoffman Skanska Joint Venture Terminal Core Construction Project. The project motto is safety before schedule. I like to use the word schedule. <laughs> Very British of you. Uh, safety culture starts at the top, and the joint venture and port leadership have made safety number one on this project. And the on-screen photo is something that happens every morning at 0600 hours. It's a stretch and flex. Everybody gathers on the project. They do their stretching exercises, and they also talk about safety and the activities for the day and the activities for the week. And it's a good way for everybody to get together and all come and practice the same message. Um, if you ever want to, it's enjoyable, especially in the summertime. It's beautiful out there to join that and have the roof over your head. I've compiled some interesting safety facts about this project up to this point. 3,572,000 labor hours have been completed as of May 2023, with a project average in 100,000 hours a month. Every person attends a two-hour orientation class prior to starting work. 4,151 personnel have attended so far, and it's anticipated there'll be another 4,000 in the upcoming years on this project. There are weekly site walks with safety leadership from the joint venture and port. In addition, airport fire and rescue participates in weekly site walks with focus on emergency response and fire protection. Uh, it's critical because we're, we're building in an operating airport versus out in the South 40. A mass safety briefing is emailed to a 600 person distribution list every week. Safety issues, both current and future, are discussed in that email that goes out to everybody involved in the project. There's a monthly safety walk that includes safety professionals from the insurance carrier, Broke, uh, Marsh, and Safe Bar Workers Comp Carrier for this project. Monthly safety meetings are held with product, project leadership to discuss incidents, innovations, milestones, and other upcoming events. Two joint rescue exercises have been held with Airport Fire and Rescue and the City of Portland's High Angle Rescue Team. We brought them out as a joint team to practice rescue off the top of the new roof. Um, for them, it was fantastic field training. And for us, it was confident to know that if we had an injury, they're there to help. An interesting tidbit, in order to ease the impact of construction, noises that we've generated during demolition and other work, We've handed out over 99,000 pairs of earplugs to passengers as they pass through. And that number will keep on climbing. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback on these earplugs. Uh, one person contacted the port and she said, this is the first set of earplugs I've ever tried that I can sleep next to my snoring husband. <laughs> you, Please tell me the brand. I think he saved my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> 
In closing, the terminal expansion project is an example of how a great safety culture is a critical component of a successful project. This demonstrated this is demonstrated in total project recordable incident rate, which is currently 1.70 per 100 workers. The Oregon average rate for construction is 3.80. Uh, with that, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Dave. Really appreciate it. And um, commissioners, I know we've talked a lot about it, but it's hard to repeat how proud I am of it. You know, not to repeat that how hard I, I, I'm honestly proud of this team and the work that we've done uh, together to make it a safe environment for not only our own employees but also our contractors it's been a great story and really appreciate it thanks. it's a true team effort yeah it's incredible thank you All right, thanks sir um a, a few other issues uh and announcements really uh, i do i'm really happy to report that in addition to our recent wage increases um at pdx uh, we now have a pdx paid time off policy at, at pdx and since adoption by the port commission in april of 2015 the PDX Workplace Initiative has implemented several terminal worker programs, including job pathways, retention requirements for airline service providers and concessionaires, employer employee relationship plans, and wage requirements. Now, in July of this year, we're implementing a minimum paid time off requirement of eight hours of paid leave per year for airline service providers and PDX service contractors. So the policy includes cabin cleaners, baggage handling, janitorial, line maintenance, wheelchair attendants catering, de-icing services, fuelers, and security services. Port contractors include parking staff, global security, and relay resources. I think as we've talked about in particular through the pandemic, pay time off really helps people stay home when they're sick. Uh, it helps our workplace be safer for everyone, uh, including our, our visitors, but also our employees, and helps employees take care of their families if needed. So really happy about that work. In May, we partnered with the Oregon Consular Corps, Nike, and uh, the state of Oregon, the city of Portland, on our annual Celebrate Trade event. It was a, a fantastic opportunity, not, not only to recognize exporters and connectivity to international markets, but also to award scholarships to a number of young people who are really the next generation of, of Oregon's leaders, um, connecting to international experiences and international cultural opportunities. Um, it also served to recognize a number of our partners in our marine and our aviation businesses and that connectivity of Oregon to the world. It was just a, a great event. So quickly, just on a bit of personal privilege, uh, two recognitions here. First, um, I'd like to honor and congratulate our port leader, Donna Prigmore, who I think I saw here a few minutes ago. Are you there, Donna? Um, thank you, Donna. Um, Donna retired in May from the Air National Guard after more than 38 years of military service in the Air Force and Air National Guard. She's been with the port for more than 15 years and was Oregon's first female Brigadier General. Um, she's really incredible, uh, a, a great asset to all of us, leads big teams over in um, the, uh, the airport, and I'll just say uh, is a leader internally that everybody recognizes and is really proud of. So if I could, Donna, thank you again for your service. Um, fortunately, that was a retirement from the National Guard and not from the Port of Portland. Uh, and then finally, this is Bobby Stedman's last commission meeting. Uh, I think as everybody knows, Bobby has been a, a dear friend to the port, uh, to me personally. She's really helped us through some of the biggest things we've done uh, in a generation here at the port. She'll be sorely missed. Um, she is uh, moving to Central Oregon and opening uh, a business of her own. Um, we'll hope to continue to access her uh, big brain on a lot of things port, but uh, I just wanna say, um, how deeply grateful I am for you and the service you provided to all of us, um, the friendship and guidance you provided to me. You're just going to be terribly missed. So thank you, Bobby. And that, Madam President, concludes my remarks. Thank you, Curtis. Um, and thank you, Bobby, also for your service to the port. Um, any, let's see, any questions or comments on the executive director's report? Okay, uh, call for motion and second for approval of the executive director's report. So move. Thank you, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, the motion carries. Uh, we'll move on to the public comment period. Um, I We have received written comments from a number of um, 
members of the public. I'll read the names of those and please correct me um, if you come forward to give testimony as well. We've received um, written comment from Mike, Mark Ewart, Ellen Saunders, Blaine Ackley, John Weigand, and James Lubisher. Uh, thank you for that. It's been uh, provided to each of the commissioners. Um, and we have uh, folks who will wish to address the commission um, and we'll start with Mike McTurnan, who I believe is on the screen. Okay, uh, we'll move then to Blaine Ackley. We can't hear you, sir. It doesn't look like he's on mute. Oh, he is muted. You're muted. I think you're unmuted on your side, sir. Okay, we'll give you a, a moment and we'll move to Gary Keller and come back. Gary Keller, if you're on. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, well, good morning and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Gary Keller and I follow the EPA's National Emissions Inventory data as I am interested in lead emissions in this country. Over the last 10 years, Hillsborough Airport has exceeded many expectations by their ability to move into the top 10 airports for lead emissions. Over 1,200 pounds of lead emissions each year places Hillsboro Airport in a quite a lofty position over the other 20,000 GA airports across America. This would also mean that this coming October during National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week, Hillsboro Airport will participate by dumping 23 pounds a breathable lead on unsuspecting children in Hillsboro. I am sure that their little lead-filled bloodstreams will thank you for that toxic gift. Once again, thanks for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Keller. Uh, we'll move to Mr. Ackley. I think you're unmuted now. Go ahead, sir. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, President Cooper Oklahoma, Vice President Alexander and Commissioners, uh, you are on the eve of a historic moment, ending the sale of leaded aviation fuel at the Hillsborough Airport. Let's review how far you've come to reach this milestone. For many years, the commission and the port have wanted to stop the sale of leaded aviation fuel at the airport, but there were always obstacles in the way. Was the unleaded fuel available and approved by the FAA? Was the new unleaded fuel able to be used by older aircraft? The port told the public that it had to wait until the fuel was available and efficacious for existing aircraft. You set a goal of ending the sale of leaded aviation fuel once it became available. You set aside the fuel tank spe specifically for the fuel. You've learned that GAMI has the FAA-approved unleaded aviation fuel available and uh, that it is available on the West Coast. And you also have learned that some general aviation airports in California are already using this fuel. So now all your criteria have been met you are prepared to offer the sale of unleaded general aviation fuel at the airport. Thank you in advance for taking this historic first step. Thank you from the children of Hillsborough who live or go to school within the vicinity of the airport. Thank you from the seniors in Hillsborough who live within the vicinity of the airport knowing that their lungs, hearts, and brains no longer suffer from the ill effects of the lead poisoning. Why not publicize your actions now by joining the CDC, the EPA, and the HUD in recognizing that National Lead Poisoning Prevention Week 
October 23rd to 29th of this year. Congratulations on stepping up to the ban of sale and leaded aviation fuel at the airport. And you know that this let, getting lead out is not a political issue. It just makes common health sense. That's all people are saying, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, next we'll move to um, Mickey Barnes, who I believe is in, here in person. Push the button, okay. Yes, thank you, um, uh, President Cooper Comas um, and commission members for this opportunity to speak before you. My name is um, Mickey Barnes. I've lived in Washington County for 30 years. I fully support replacing leaded avgas with unleaded fuel options at all Port of Portland owned and operated airports. Both Tro Troutdale and Hillsboro are among the 100 most lead polluted airports in the country, as Blaine said, out of 20,000 airports. Uh, in addition, I urge you to issue a proclamation in honor of Lead Poisoning Prevention Week, sponsored by the EPA, CDC, and um, HUD this October. Uh, there are now multiple peer-reviewed studies involving over 500 airports and more than a million children all provide compelling evidence that children living in the vicinity of airports that service piston engine aircraft are at elevated risk of lead exposure and poisoning. Uh, a um, August 2021 lead study at the Reed Hill, Hillview Airport commissioned by the Santa Clara County uh, Board of Supervisors uh, found that um, after analyzing over 17,000 blood lead level samplings, that children living in proximity to that airport had um, elevated blood lead levels. Uh, the, according to the researchers, under periods of high piston engine aircraft traffic, children proximate to Reed Hillview Airport experienced an increase in blood lead levels in excess of what the children of Flint experienced during the Flint water crisis. Um, they also um, found that the volume of piston engine air traffic and the amount of leaded fuel sold at the airport um, contributed to these elevated level levels. Uh, in the words of Dr. Sammy Zaran, an expert researcher on the study, quote, the Flint water crisis from start to finish unfolded in less than a year and a half. By contrast, at Reed Hillview, the release of lead into the lived environment is a continuous, nonstop, daily, unabated flow of an undeniably harmful toxicant. I remind you that we're talking about more than a thousand pounds of lead released annually on nearby populations. In response to the study, to their credit, the Santa Clara Board of Supervisors unanimously voted to ban leaded aviation fuel. Uh, this is a jurisdiction that cared more about the health of the people living in that area than they did about turning a profit for the aviation industry. Uh, they also voted to expedite uh, efforts to close the airport. Um, it's important to bear in mind, based on 2017 EPA data, that Reed Hillview ranked 34th among 20,000 airports in lead emissions. Hillsborough Airport ranks eighth. Um, it historically releases more lead into the environment every single year, which it has done for decades uh, than Reed Hillview does or did. Um, also, there was a Michigan study. Again, Sammy Zaran was the lead researcher on that. This involved over a million children in 448 airports that found children living near the airport had elevated blood lead levels. Um, as stated in the study, quote, the consequences of lead exposure in childhood are lasting. 
Neuroimaging studies find that adults exposed to lead as children have reduced gray matter in regions of the brain known to govern executive judgment, impulsivity, and mood regulation. Economists have convincingly linked these intellectual and socio-emotional traits of judgment and impulsivity to long-term life outcomes. Persons exposed to lead in early life experience an unfolding series of adverse behavioral outcomes, behavioral problems as a child, pregnancy and aggression as a teen, and criminal behavior as a young adult. I, I personally, you know, watching this can't help but wonder across this country if part of the increased violence we're seeing has to do with continually dosing people with lead. I think it's worth looking into. And finally, the, uh, there was a study in 2011, uh, the geospatial analysis on the effects of aviation gasoline on childhood blood lead levels. Um, and that one um, observed 125,000 blood lead levels in six North Carolina counties. They found, um, quote, our analysis indicates that living within 1,000 meters of an airport where Avgas is used may have a significant effect on blood lead levels in children, unquote. I did speak uh, years ago with the author of that study, Marie Miranda, and uh, she said not a single flight training airport was included among these uh, North Carolina counties. And I can vouch from where I live that, that 12 miles from the airport, I made a conscious effort to move a distance from that airport. And yet these pilots come and they circle my home, sometimes for an hour on end. And no sooner does one get done than another comes out. And we're not even talking about proximity to an airport here. I, I find it unbearable to watch the touch and go, and I keep flight radar on most of the time, to watch the touch and go patterns over Hillsboro, where, um, you know, a four to five mile radius, there's something like 14 schools, uh, daycare centers, senior centers, close to uh, a half a million um, adults die every day from coronary heart disease. Uh, due to uh, lead contamination. I mean, this is astounding that as a civilized society, we are poisoning our own people. This needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, James Lubisher. Please correct my pronunciation of your name if I got it wrong. Uh, good morning. I'm Jim Lubisher, a retired pediatrician, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, we know that Hillsborough Airport ranks high in the nation in lead admissions. We know air around HIO contains lead. Children who live within one mile of HIO have higher amounts of lead in their blood. We know there is no safe blood lead level. We know that lead poisoning damages the brain, resulting in reduced gray matter as Mickey was referring to, in regions of the brain known to govern executive function, impulsivity, and mood regulation. And we know that this <clears throat> brain damage causes lower IQ scores, speech difficulties, ADD, ADHD, behavioral problems, risk of failure to complete high school, pregnancy and aggression as a teen, criminal behavior as a young adult. We know that children who live within one mile of HIO have higher blood lead levels. We know the closer a child lives to HIO, the higher their blood levels are. And we know that there are four schools, many homes, and a library within one mile of HIO. We know that the FAA has approved the GAMI unleaded fuel, which can be used in all piston engine aircraft. Four weeks ago, I spoke with John Paul at GAMI who told me that if the port wants to switch to an unleaded fuel at HIO, the port should contact them sending an email to GAMI's president, Tim Rowell, and request that HIO be put on GAMI's list to receive this unleaded fuel, G100UL. GAMI is prioritizing West Coast airports with flight training companies. I implore the port to 
protect our children from brain damage and stop the lead pollution in Hillsboro. I have also submitted more detailed written comments, which are to be included in the minutes of today's meeting. Those written comments include a list of frequently asked questions about GAMI's FAA-approved unleaded fuel for all piston engine aircraft. I look forward to our um, next presentation about the uh, unleaded fuel at Hillsboro Airport. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I do want to confirm we've received your written comment and they're part of the record. Thank and you. I, I gave that um, colored map. Yes. That just shows the Hillsborough Airport and uh, the two polygon circles. The one is at a thousand meters. Within a thousand meters, that's where the, the statistically the kids have the higher blood lead levels. And there's still an increase out to 1500 meters, which I just equate with a mile in my talk today. A lot of homes there, a lot of kids there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have John Weigand. My name is John Wygant. I live at one. Right. Your microphone's not on. Yes, thank you. My name is John Wygant. I live at 18989 Northeast Marine Drive. That is a floating home. Have I gone on? One of these is going to work. That's uh, a floating home marina that uh, I thank the Port of Portland for creating for me. It was one of their bad decisions. Uh, in the early 1980s, they were intending to uh, extend PDX runways onto Government Island, and there was a moorage in the area that was in the way, so they bought it, told everybody to move. Everybody said, there's no place to go, so they made the port build a moorage where I now live. It's a very good moorage. They lost about $2 million on the process. In my testimony, I have copies for each of you that I'll hand out, and you may have received them by email. Did you? Okay, I can't possibly go through all that. I am primarily a climate activist, and the port's decisions in the past have had many failures, and the failure to eliminate uh, Avgas, let it have gas from uh, HIO is one of their failures. Another one of their failures is not recognizing that climate change is a serious problem, which I've attempted to document. And uh, we must be looking to the future to reduce air travel in every form. That is not your job, but it is your job to see the future and make sure that we are uh, accommodating it. The port has spent vast amounts of money and I have had a long experience. I am donating my records starting from about 1996 for my involvement to the, uh, with the port. And I'm hoping that you will find, or the staff will find some of those of interest for their archives. As a result of the 1996 uh, port, uh, master plan, the 2020 master plan for the airport, they projected that the port would need another third parallel 12,000 foot runway by 2020 and a second terminal. I'm a former urban planner and uh, my specialty is population projection. The population and growth projections of that master plan were simply absurd. Later, the port, uh, uh, as a result, we formed AIR, the Airport Issues Roundtable, that uh, worked under Commissioner Salzman for the City of Portland, a consortium of neighborhoods surrounding the airport. And we fought again and again and again. And my records of that are here. And I welcome you to have them because I live in a houseboat and I don't want the extra weight. So... Uh, your job is to see the future. 
the future, particularly of aviation and of economic development in the region. And the past history of that has not been good. I've documented a few of the uh, planning errors that I know about. The one expecting a third 12,000 foot parallel runway to be needed by 2020 and a second terminal uh, was rejected at the next master plan when the port concerned about the noise and problems that we had raised for them started a new process and said we are going to have a massive public involvement process and at the time we will have both a new master plan and a new plan district because the conditional use permit under which we were operating, an airport in an industrial zone, wasn't working well. So we agreed. The process lasted about a year, and it said that by 2035, no third runway would be needed and no second terminal would be needed. So look at the elegance of, oh, yeah, part of the uh, assumptions of the 1996 uh, plan for 2020 was that oil would remain at $10 a barrel through the year 2020. And many of the other projections were similarly optimistic. So we now have an airport that has won many awards starting shortly after the 2035 plan was done. I asked the chief consultant uh, of the plan, uh, what he thought of our result toward the end of it. And he said, I've never seen anything like it. Far and away, it's the best master plan I've ever worked on. That's after 20 years of master planning. So I ask the Port Commission to look seriously at your future. Hillsboro is part of it. Aviation is part of it. Why are we training Chinese pilots to come here and learn how to fly airplanes? It's, uh, it makes no sense because the future with a loss, uh, with a, an accumulation of CO2 uh, is heating the planet and we are in a different time now. So my written testimony has four appendices that says the laws of physics says we need to change. And that's a paradigm change, a paradigm shift. And those are very difficult. So I hope you take this small uh, project into mind, cancel um, flight training, particularly flight training for Chinese pilots, and look to the future because the future is very grim. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I've answered a bunch of them in my written testimony. There are spare copies. And I will leave this for the port to go through at their convenience and throw out as they wish. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we did receive your written testimony with the appendices. Thank you for that. Thank you. Where shall I put this? You can leave it there. We'll have staff pick it up for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, you can leave it right there. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That were, those were the folks who we had signed up to provide public comment today. So we'll move to our general discussion item and I'll call on Dan Pippinger. To, I'm sorry, go ahead, Commissioner. Um, I just want to thank you for your testimony and for your advocacy on behalf of climate. Um, as a commissioner, it was not lost on me that during the pandemic, I thought one of the bright sides of that was the was the discontinuation of so much air travel because of the impact on climate. And I am sometimes feel at odds on this commission because as we almost cheer on the addition and the return of air travel um, and and wanting it to actually exceed pre-pandemic levels. Um, and, and there's a passenger desire for that, but I think there is also a massive impact on our climate overall for air travel. So I just wanna know that I hear you and I appreciate your activism on behalf of our climate. Thank you, Commissioner. And I, I will pause to ensure no one else has comments. I apologize. Okay, uh, thank you, Dan, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for the time this morning. 
Uh, we certainly have heard the community concerns and shared them about leaded aviation gas and aircraft noise at Hillsborough Airport. Um, we are connected with these concerns through the Hillsborough Airport Community Advisory Committee, through public testimony, and certainly through our um, noise committee as well, which uh, you're familiar with, uh, uh, do some recent um, public comments on that as well. Uh, we are proactively engaged with the FAA and with our tenants to encourage the development, production, and distribution of unleaded aviation gas at Hillsborough Airport and at Troutdale Airport, uh, and we're looking forward to that. I noted the comments today that GAMI uh, is prioritizing West Coast airports. That's a very um, positive symbol, and we'll certainly reach out to talk to them. But I would be clear that the production of wholesale unleaded gas is not readily available, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the presentation. Uh, here to give the presentation is Kama Simmons. She is the Senior Manager of Airside Operations and General Aviation for the Port of Portland. Good morning. Hillsborough Airport. Oh, next slide, please. That's, yeah, just more of me. Hillsborough Airport started in what was then a very rural part of the metro area. Over the past 100 years, the city of Hillsborough has grown up around the airport. Today, Hillsborough is the second busiest airport in Oregon when counting the number of takeoffs and landings. This airport is home to three fixed base operators, two flight training academies, air ambulance services, Intel's employee only air shuttle, and Nike and Columbia Sportswear have corporate aircraft bases there. We're all aware that aviation took quite a hit during COVID. General aviation was no exception. Economic impact data from 2015 shows that Hillsborough supports 1,500 jobs and supports $107.4 million in business revenues. General Aviation has rebounded to at or above pre-COVID levels. We'll be looking at updated economic impact data as part of the port's ongoing economic analysis project. As may be expected, when residential areas develop near an airport, community concerns emerge. This is not unique to Hillsborough. There are inherent natural tensions that exist nationwide. However, we work to understand community concerns and be responsive where we can. Next slide, please. One of the concerns expressed by the community surrounding the Hillsborough Airport, as you've heard, is that of air emissions from leaded fuel. Leaded fuel is the only available fuel that works for all piston aircraft, which make up most of the operations at Hillsborough Airport. That said, by volume, most of the fuel sold at Hillsborough Airport is unleaded jet fuel used by aircraft supporting business aviation. The EPA is the agency that regulates ambient air quality and has established thresholds for lead. Oregon DEQ is the regulatory authority that responsible for monitoring and testing air quality in our state. DEQ's data shows that air emissions around Hillsborough Airport continue to fall below the EPA threshold for lead, though community concerns remain. Efforts are underway in the industry to develop unleaded fuels for use in piston aircraft. The port supports a safe transition to lead-free aviation fuel. Under current regulations, the port cannot prohibit the sale of FAA-approved fuel, even fuel containing lead. But we can support the transition and we have taken actions to move in the right direction. Next slide, please. Before I share how the port is supporting the transition to lead-free aviation fuel, a quick primer on different types of these fuels is warranted. The FAA must approve all types of aviation fuel as applied to the full range of piston engines. The FAA has not yet found a universal replacement fuel. However, it is anticipated that in 2023, GAMI's 100 unleaded aviation fuel will be approved for most piston engine aircraft. This will be a huge leap forward, but it won't solve all of our problems. PAFI fuel is the only truly universal solution, and it's still under development by the FAA. Even when production starts, though, scaling up to support commercial distribution will take time. We would expect that any unleaded fuel replacement must have a consistent supply that's competitively priced. Right now, 100 low lead fuel remains the standard for piston aircraft. Next slide, please. 
Again, the port is committed to supporting this transition to unleaded aviation fuel. And we've been engaged with the community and with industry on trying to address concerns about lead emissions from piston aircraft for the better part of a decade. In 2015, the port commissioned a study about the potential use of unleaded automobile fuel for aircraft. Some aircraft could use this fuel, so we upgraded a storage tank for FBO's use. Ultimately, the Transportation Research Board concluded that there were some safety concerns, and we've seen that pilots prefer to wait until new fuels are proven safe and effective. We are one of only six airports nationwide participating in the FAA's EAGLE initiative, which is developing a roadmap to safely eliminate aviation leaded fuel use by 2030. There are multiple work groups within this initiative. We sit on the committee that is providing input to the FAA as they develop their roadmap for commercialization and distribution. Our work with EAGLE will ensure that once universal unleaded fuel is available, the infrastructure and policies are in place to ensure transition and adoption. We're keeping an eye on the EPA's proposed endangerment finding, which, if finalized, would begin a process to ban leaded AV gas and involve actions for both EPA and FAA. The publication of the final rule would not trigger an immediate ban on the use of lead in aviation gasoline. However, it would signal its inevitable and eventual prohibition. Finally, we're tracking the development of the unleaded fuel supply chain. Fuels cannot be mixed in an aircraft, so unleaded fuel needs to be widely available at many airports for refueling. Production of unleaded fuels is starting, but it's currently limited and requires long distance transport, making it very expensive. There's not yet a consistent supply nor a competitive price. The port is engaged with FBOs on this issue and we're poised to support their efforts to bring unleaded aviation fuel to Hillsborough Airport. We've prepared, prepared infrastructure at the airport to receive these fuels when available, and we're poised to offer a distribution incentive to, partner, to a partner willing to undertake this venture. We're also doing a feasibility study to better understand the FBO's logistical and financial barriers to early adoption of currently available unleaded fuels and to help assess what role we can play in reducing or eliminating said barriers. We're hoping these efforts result in early adoption of currently available unleaded fuels ahead of the FAA's 2030 goal for a universal solution. Next slide, please. Noise is another area of concern out near Hillsborough Airport. With the city growing around the airport through the years, we now have noise sensitive areas to the west, south, and east. Of most concern is flight training with its repetitive, frequent trips. Next slide, please. To address community concerns about noise from the airport, the port engaged in several strategies. We partnered with the FAA's air traffic control tower and the flight schools at Hillsboro and implemented a fly friendly program that includes these noise abatement strategies. Avoid overflying the same location repeatedly during training. Manage prop pitch and power settings to minimize noise. Utilize flight paths that overfly sparsely populated areas. When possible, fly around noise sensitive areas. And the instructors are encouraged to point out noise sensitive areas to their students. Where it's constructive and effective, port staff continue to be responsive to and engage with community members who call the port's noise hotline with questions and concerns. Additionally, one of the flight training schools in Hillsborough opted to move most of their helicopter training to Troutdale Air Airport. This helped alleviate noise over sensitive areas in Hillsborough since helicopters travel at lower altitudes and their flight patterns are more impactful. Through master planning efforts, we understand the airport's noise contours and there are no incompatible land uses on or around the airport. The FAA is the sole regulatory agency for aviation once planes are flying. The port cannot control who flies where and when. Next slide, please. Since 2001, we've held the Hillsborough Airport Air Fair, which is, which is an event where we invite the community to come tour the airport and learn about the operation the aviation industry, and how the airport supports the community. Since 2013, the port has also staffed a booth at the City of Hillsborough's Celebrate Hillsborough event, again, inviting the community to learn about how the airport supports 
and impact the local community. The port hosts several public involvement committees to discuss airport business and issues of concern. A Citizens Noise Advisory Committee meets regularly to maintain open dialogue with community members around noise impacts at all of our airports. More than 20 years ago, the port started hosting the Hillsborough Airport Issues Roundtable, or HAIR, which gathered members of the business and residential communities to discuss airport issues. The Issues Roundtable sunset with the start of the last master plan in 2016. As an outgrowth of the completed master plan in 2018, the port once again hosted a community committee known as the Hillsborough Airport Community Advisory Committee, or HACA. This committee meets three times a year with representatives from the airport, business community, and local citizens. We expect that the next master planning effort in 2026 will help improve existing or identify new productive engagement opportunities with community members. Next slide. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I, I have a few questions and I'm sure other commissioners do as well. Um, I wanted to confirm it sounded like the um, business flights out of the Hillsborough Airport are not using the fuel that is at issue here. Most of the business jets use unleaded jet fuel, which is different than Avgas. Okay, thank you. Um, and then could you talk us through a little bit, you, you mentioned that the port doesn't have authority to ban a particular kind of fuel. There's fuel being developed, including the GAMI fuel that was mentioned um, by several uh, of the people who gave public testimony. What What is the timeline for, for that being really commercially available in a volume that we could expect? Um, and, and I guess I'm thinking about if it's, I, I understood your point that we you can't mix gas, but if it's flight schools that are taking off and landing at Hillsborough, maybe they don't need fuel changes. I don't know specifically the volume uh, being produced in the transportation, but obviously when the volume is available and can be brought to Hillsborough and we can figure out how to make it competitively priced so it will be adopted is when we'll do it. And we're hoping that's sooner than later. Uh, I, again, to the, my comment earlier, I was interested in the comments that GAMI is uh, asking for airports to get on a list. So we'll certainly be in contact with them directly. Our understanding right now is it's just not available in volume, but we can follow up with the commission once we find out more detailed information on their distribution and production schedule. Thank you. I think we'd all be really interested in knowing what the timeline is and how how far up the list we can get. Uh, so are we. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioners? Commissioner Sumput? Yep. And then are there other airports uh, where there are flight training schools uh, who uh, we might have been in contact with who've adopted uh, uh, unleaded fuel? I don't think we're necessarily in contact with them, but our understanding is that the commercial availability is not there for full adoption at this time. So it, it, it'd be good to get an update on terms of uh, clearly you and your team are working on on this. It'd be uh, good to get an update as to you know what our options are. Absolutely. Commissioner Koba. I think I heard in your testimony a comment about the port exploring uh, once commercial fuel is available, knowing that it's going to probably be expensive, what kind of uh, incentives the port may be able to invest in to make that more competitive. Are you? Can you speak to that in any more detail this morning? Unfortunately not. I mean, but we're we're pragmatic that without some kind of subsidy or distribution credit, it's not going to be widely adopted until the price comes way down. Uh, it's the same uh, situation with um, aviation fuel here at PDX with sustainable aviation fuel. It's being produced, but again, the uh, price difference is an impediment to its adoption production and distribution. So these are similar problems we're wrestling with, and we recognize that as the airport, we may have a role to play in helping that adoption come through. In the long run, though, we can't be buying fuel for, for our tenants. I understand that and agree with you. I do think 
um, we're all interested in doing anything we can to move move away from using lead if fuel, correct? And so just strongly encourage uh, exploring every avenue to do that. And if there's at least an initial kind of investment the port can make that fits yes. <laughs> and can incentivize moving down the road, we ought to look into that knowing that that's not something on a long term we can continue to afford to do. Thank you. I just point out that we have prepared infrastructure both at PDX for sustainable aviation fuel and also at Hillsborough for unleaded gasoline. That's definitely a role we can play, uh, both with our tenants and ourselves to prepare infrastructure so that cost is not into the system as well. Uh, and we're, we're looking then on how we can incent that distribution and arrival of the fuel. Commissioner Luther. Um, Thank you for, for your report. Um, I'm definitely uh, in support of being an early adopter when it's economically feasible and practical to do so. Um, my question though relates to any additional information you have about um, safety. And uh, you mentioned that, I assume that when FAA approves, but is there any available information about whether there's any safety concerns with the different type of fuel, or I assume that is what's currently holding up the approval? Uh, the the GAMI fuel that was just approved is certainly approved for certain types of aircraft. So the FAA has uh, gone past their testing to say that that is safe to use. It's not available for all aircraft. And uh, as uh, Kama mentioned, there's this program PATHY to get a universal replacement. So uh, you won't have to have multiple types of fuel for different types of aircraft. Uh, that said, it can uh, serve a lot of aircraft and certainly a lot of the ones at Hillsboro. So when the FAA approves it, they've gone through the safety testing. Our earlier uh, efforts to use unleaded um, uh, automobile gas uh, was an early effort to get unleaded aviation gas in and modified. And that uh, caused some safety uh, concerns from the Transportation Research Board because it hadn't gone through the rigorous testing for all the different types of engines and under the conditions they're in. So I think when it's approved by the FAA, we're thumbs up, it's safe and it's usable. So if I'm hearing correctly, GAMI is approved by the FAA. We're concerned about whether there's um, enough of it in the scale and cost. Okay. Those are the two issues we're wrestling with with GAMI and any fuels that are approved, even if it's the universal fuel, scale and cost are going to be tough, but it has to start somewhere. Okay. And I think you said we don't have the right to ban or, or we don't have authority to ban a particular kind of fuel. Is that a federal? That is correct. Okay. Um, so you'll come back with, to us with after you've spoken to the folks at GAMI to let us know generally? Absolutely. As soon as we can get a feel for a distribution and supply and what we might do to incent that and get it where it's going to be used at Hillsborough, we'll certainly update the commission. Thank you. And then on the the uh, more universal fuel, do you have a sense given um, the, the project that you sit on um, of how far out that is? I do not. Sorry. I'll add that when I do the follow-up report. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I think we have some follow-up and we'd really appreciate more information. Um, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. I will move on to our consent item and I'll ask if any commissioner wants a presentation of the consent item. Um, I'll read the title. It is Equipment Procurement Contract, Airport Runway, Snow Removal Equipment, Portland International Airport. Okay, uh, seeing no uh, need for a presentation, I'll call for motion and second for approval of the consent item. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, our action item will be presented by Vince Granada. Uh, good morning. We have an item here, personal services amendment uh, for ZGF as we move more into 
getting closer to opening what the services are that we need for them and falls into more construction administration versus the design work. Uh, so we've been kind of metering their money out uh, to make sure we're uh, satisfied with the work. And of course, it's been great, but uh, we're now getting more into um, uh, construction administration uh, and what it takes to actually start to put all of the um, equipment, the design and the pieces in place. So George is here to ask for uh, approval for that. Thank you, Vince. Next slide, please. So we're asking for, for $20 million for ZGF for construction administration. Construction administration is basically uh, supporting the design to the construction phases. So it's answering requests for in, uh, information, reviewing submittals, uh, set observation reports, just all the things to make sure that what was designed is put in properly. Next slide, please. From an overall schedule perspective, uh, we've completed the slab on the decks. The uh, ticket lobby roof removal, if you're out the terminal, you'll see a lot of the work getting started on that. That should be started in the next couple of weeks, actually um, peeling the old roof off. Uh, the curtain wall on the east side, if you're in the parking garage, you can see most of that curtain wall is complete. There's just a couple of spots that should be complete this week that'll be uh, uh, some glass that we need to get custom fabricated for some some drains that are coming off the building, but that'll be closed in the end of the week. Uh, the slab on grade work at the Western Expansion is almost 100% complete by the end of the month, exception of one final pour. Uh, next slide, please. Like I do at most of these presentations, I think I have a number of images I'll go through pretty quickly. Maybe. There we go. Uh, so this is a Kind of tough to tell on the on the image but you can see the curtain wall uh over over concourse d uh being installed uh this was the end of last month we've actually got the next bay so the first dome of the roof on the west side is now fully enclosed with the curtain wall uh that's been one of our major concerns as we went through the project they're really starting to get momentum uh gaining a lot of time as they go through the the west side of the building uh next slide Here's an image uh, looking at the, the um, recomposure area coming out of the south checkpoint. Uh, one of the things you can see a lot of the work going on in the mezzanine and closing that mezzanine. Uh, Sheetrock's getting ready to get started pretty soon there. Uh, point out the, the um, white wall to side, temporary wall. Um, as we get the curtain wall or as we remove the roof from the existing um, ticket lobby, you'll see that wall above the ticketing and and then blocking the construction site and then and as time goes on that will actually be the wall between uh the phase one completion and the next part of the of the job and the construction and there's kind of the op opposite vision that dave showed earlier during construction you can see the uh, uh restaurant area being being constructed there to the right and then the mezzanine on the left side one of the things to point out here is we've always talked about a walk in the forest and with the big skylights and some of the the dappled effect of the sunlight coming down. I think this really shows as that moves through the through the terminal building. Next slide. Uh, overall schedule perspective, we're on schedule for completion of phase one and the ticket hall and security of May of next year. Uh, and then the final completion for most of the work by the end of 25. We anticipate being back uh, next month for uh, an amendment or for the JV, uh, Hoffman's against your JV, as well as uh, a contract for them to do the ground source system. Next slide. Uh, we've been here a number of times to commission for the ZGF contract amendment. Just kind of point out a couple of them there. Uh, Concourse B was the design through mid uh, 18 through 19. Actually, the this was the first contract amendment. We, our first contract we showed to commission in September 2015 was for the ZGF, ZGF contract. Uh, design was complete uh, last year, and we've been kind of over, significant overlap between design and construction administration going forward. Last October, we were here for construction administration uh, for about $12 million. Uh, and this, this contract amendment now is to get us through at least the summer of next year, probably a little bit later than that. Next slide, please. So uh, we anticipate being back uh, probably closer to next fall for about $10 million and then a final closeout construction administration as we get later later in the project with ZGF. Uh, next slide, please. Big picture on project budget. Uh, we are tracking to our 
our overall 2.15 billion. Uh, we've been using kind of a, on a monthly basis, a little bit of contingencies went forward, but it's right on what we have planned. Uh, with this contract amendment, ZGF is still anticipating their overall small business participation of about, uh, of about 10%. Next slide. Uh, to date, we've issued a little over 100 or 103, 83 and a half uh, million dollars to ZGF. With this amendment, they'll be up to about 203 and a half million dollars. Next slide. Staff recommends approval of uh, the executive director's um, recommendation for $20 million. And are there any questions? Thank you. I know you went through that quickly since we have the other meeting coming yep. up. Any questions on this item? No questions, but I do appreciate the staging of this over time. I mean, this has been a long path, but unpacking it in the way that you have, I think, just burdens and deepen our understanding, the complexity and the urgency around doing it right. So yeah, thank you. Hey, uh, I'll call for motion second for approval of the executive director's recommendation on this contract. So move. Thank you. Any further discussion? OK, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Motion carries and we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you.